Welcome to Tail Learn Code. Here there will be tales about software development, learning from each other, code to build solutions. And now your host, Chad Green. All right, so welcome everyone. Thank you for, for joining us. Let me go ahead and get us started. Um, and also welcome, you know, not, not just on, to, on Zoom, but also on, on Twitch. Sure enough, for those on Twitch, if you have any questions, definitely put them in the chat and I will make sure they get forwarded on over here. Um, before we get to our presentation, a couple quick little things. Uh, there we go. All right. Um, so first off, you know, always want to thank our sponsors. You know, um, even though we're not meeting in person, they still are, you know, partners with us, you know, helping us keep things keep things going on, on the on the meetup. Um, there are our sponsors. In particular, you know, Modus and then uh, on. Perry, you were gonna you were gonna say something for a moment. Yeah, uh, um, I apologize for not having a video camera speed right now. Can you hear um, me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. Um, I got a haircut and everything, and now you guys can't even tell. Um, uh, yeah, I am Terry. I work with Modus. I'm a recruiter over here, and I primarily work on the IT side of recruitment. I do a lot of work on the development and software engineering um, roles, but lately have had some other ones, project manager, security, all that good stuff. So um, just giving um, y'all a chance to get to know me. <laughs> and what we do. So feel free to touch base with me at any time or any of my team if you are either looking for a role or looking to fill a role or if you just want feedback, advice, touching base to say what's up, you know, any of that kind of stuff. Um, and um, eventually one day I'll meet all in person if we haven't before. So hopefully I'll be able to figure out my camera by tomorrow because that's my job is to have a face. <laughs> hopefully we work this out, but I appreciate getting the time to say hello. Thank you so much. I'm muting all the There we go. That was interesting because I was muting all, but somehow we were getting distributing feedback. All right. So um, thank you. Well, that's why. All right. Uh, so, all right. Upcoming meetup. So next month, uh, we will have uh, Christos, and I cannot remember his last name off the top of my head, but uh, uh, talking about uh, identity, Microsoft identity. Uh, he's actually one of the evangelists or, or uh, advocates, I should say. I still use the old term. Uh, uh, on the Microsoft Identity team. So this should be a really good uh, presentation. Um, I really could use that this month, to be honest with you, but uh, but he'll be doing that next next month. Um, and I am working, I, I should say, I'm working on a whole bunch of, uh, with a bunch of other speakers, uh, trying to get the next couple months scheduled uh, for Louisville.net and Louisville Azure. Um, but also, you know, to point out, you know, uh, we are tied with uh, the .NET Foundation um, and actually, some folks, you know, on this call are coming in through the uh, through the .NET uh, Foundation's uh, virtual user group. Definitely a great way to check that out. You know, at some point, uh, lots of great uh, uh, presentations on there. You can see, um, and really from all over the world, which is kind of neat. So, you know, uh, whatever time works well for you, there's probably a presentation going on. All right, a little bit uh, shameless plug. I do stream. Apparently uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday um, at 8 p.m. Eastern Time at Taylor and Code. Uh, generally, it's working on something with C Sharp and Azure. Uh, right now, I've been working on a a uh, Twitch bot. Um, it's doing a little bit more than just uh, the bot type stuff. Um, actually, tomorrow we're we'll be working on trying to get the bot to control OBS to update things in OBS to to uh, show things and so forth. Our last thing, you know, we normally keep a slide in here to remind myself to tell everyone, hey, we're going to go to BJ's. We can't go to BJ's. Um, but sure enough, after the presentation, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll actually disconnect from, from Twitch so we're not broadcasting ourselves all over the internet. But, uh, uh, you know, those here in Zoom, you know, definitely stay on and, we, you know, we can just chat and, and I'll keep the Zoom line open as long as uh, folks are, you know, want to talk, right? And uh, sometimes it means we get off after a half hour. Sometimes it means we get off after three and a half hours, right? So it's, Whatever it's uh, really, however the the, the uh, group wants. 
start with that. So sure enough, um, a couple months ago, um, I was I presented well, and so did Adam at uh, uh, NDC Sydney, and I saw this presentation. I, I actually haven't seen the presentation. I saw the write up, but the timing didn't work right for me as far as watching the presentation. But I saw the write up, and I just thought this was just such a neat concept, um, and especially for January. I always try to do something a little bit different in January. Um, so that's why, you know, I asked Adam to, uh, to speak and he was more than willing to do so. And, and with that, I'll turn it over to Adam. Cool. Thank you. So, hey, everyone, my name is Adam, and we are going to learn how to build a computer using light bulbs and light switches. I do hope you can see my screen. If you cannot, then let me click it again. Yeah, you need to reshare. Here it's how about now? Cool. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, Okay, so you already asked me why this presentation, why from bulbs to, to C sharp or to high level language. Uh, well, the idea is that uh, we can actually build a computer with anything. It's really a trivial concept. What we are going to see during this talk is that it's not a matter of the concept or a matter of like how to do it. It's a matter of how doing, doing it fast. So the computer works really fast. It can scale up to, to the demand we have to like gigahertz and all that stuff. That was actually the bigger stop, uh, the bigger obstacle we had to actually overcome when working on computers. And this obstacle was overcome last, uh, basically last century. So this is why we have computers nowadays, but technically the idea of a computer and like the, the know, know how to do it was available like way back there. Uh, before we actually move on, a couple words about me. Uh, so my name is Adam Furmanek and I am currently working at Amazon uh, doing machine learning stuff. I'm in the industry for almost 10 years now. I was doing a lot of back and front and web applications, et cetera, et cetera. Currently for the last couple of years, I'm working more on the machine learning side, doing uh, recommendations in Prime Video or voice generation in Amazon Alexa. I am also an author of the .NET Internals Cookbook. Uh, so if you are interested in internals of .NET platform and you are looking for something which is like neat and concise, this is a, a great book. I recommend you take a look at it. It is constructed as a series of like 100 questions and answers. Uh, so if you are interested in some internals, just go there, read the answer and find links and hyperlinks to, to some other sources which you can read about. Uh, also feel free to take a look at my blog at blog.adamformanek.pl. Drop me a line or email, tweet ask questions during this talk, whatever you find useful, or just reach out afterwards if you find it better. Okay, so now agenda for this talk. Uh, we are going to start with light switches, we'll take bulbs, and we'll build a computer. We are going to actually build a computer, something which is capable of performing calculations and something which is a true, uh, truly is a computer. And then we'll try to figure out how to make it work faster, how to scale it up, and actually how to build something which we use nowadays, so how to get to the high level language. So this is the idea for this talk. And we'll start with building something simple, and then we make a big leap to, to the C sharp language at the very end. So Stay tuned and bear with me. We are going to build something nice for today because bulb or light switch is all we need. Um, why is that? Well, because bulb is something which basically emits a light. So it is a thing which we can use to as an output device. Light switch may be a, basically a very simple output device whenever light is on. We can consider this being uh, like a bit one or a set bit. Whenever the light is turned off, we consider this being zero. So we already see that we can just by using light switch, we can like we can store one bit of memory or use this one bit. And the important thing here is that we can control the light switch just by changing the state of the circuit here. So you do see that we have a switch here. If I connect these two wires here, then basically the, the current starts flowing in the circuit and you can see that the bulb starts emitting light. So this is the idea. This is where we start. We have the battery, we have the, which is basically a power source. We have the light switch, which is basically like some kind of an output device. And we have a piece of wire connecting all these things together. So starting with this, what we are going to do is we would like to build memory. We would like to build calculation unit. We would like to build the, the oscillator and the clock. We would like to build basically anything which we have in computers which sits on our desktops. 
So let's move on. Uh, the important thing, uh, something which we probably do not realize, but is something which when we think about that seems to be pretty obvious, is that we can use light switches to communicate with others. Imagine that we have two light bulbs and imagine there is like one big room here and the other big room is over there in Louisville. By the way, I am currently now in Europe talking to you and it's like one a.m. in my time zone. So if I fall asleep, then please do forgive me. But imagine that I do have a very long piece of wire starting here in Europe and going there to Louisville. So what happens is if I do have this piece of wire, if I do have the battery and I do have light switch on your side, I can basically close the circuit here at this point. If I close the circuit here, you can see that the electricity, that the current starts flowing in the circuit and you see some light on your end. Even though I am here in Europe and you are over there, you will see the light and you can do actually the same. You have the switch on your side and once you close it, the, the current starts flowing here. So I will have some light being emitted on my side. So this is what we can do. Obviously this piece of wire would need to be super long and super strong to not lose the energy. But basically, if you ever wondered how the telegraph works, this is basically, well, how it is constructed. What we do have is we have a very long piece of wire going between continents. We have basically a button which closes the circuits. And then we have some, uh, some dynamo, so electromagnet on the other side, which makes sound. So this is how the telegraph Telegraph works, and this is how we can communicate between continents. We can communicate actually across the world using this idea. Uh, only to make the notation a little simpler, when we started with this uh, with this slide, when we have the the battery here, and we have this long circuit, which you can see is uh, makes a loop, right? It's a closed circuit. What we typically draw instead of doing this is we introduce a couple more symbols here. So first, instead of having this circuit being like this long and connecting everything, we indicate that there is one, uh, one uh, part of this wire connected to the ground, like to the earth. So this is why we call it ground. And we can basically physically connect this wire to a very big uh, pole, which would be like a uh, dig in the, in the earth, and it would work well. Also, instead of drawing batteries everywhere, we just use the letter V as a voltage. So this is the notation we have here. Everything else stays the same. So we do have light switch and we do have the, the, the switch we can turn on or turn off to basically transfer things uh, or transfer signal. So this is where we begin. And what we would like to do first to build a computer is we would like to implement a Boolean logic. This is basically a very first thing which we typically do. So we would like to implement a couple of operators like conjunction and disjunction. So the operators you probably know from C sharp like end and ampersand ampersand or pipe pipe. Uh, obviously negation and obviously XOR. So these operations you know from your programming language. And there are also two other operations which are pretty useful when we are talking about circuits, when we are talking about light, like more physical stuff. These two operations are called NOT AND, which is abbreviated as NAND, and NOT OR, which is abbreviated as NOR. So these two operations will also build here. And let's see how we can build these operations, build these operators, Boolean logic, uh, just by using light switches. So the idea is straightforward. Uh, in order to implement a conjunction operator, what we need to do is we need to have two switches connected serially, like one after the another. So you can see that the light, the, the bulb will start emitting light only after both of these switches are closed. So the whole circuit is closed. And then we will have this, uh, this light bulb emitting the light here. Typically, instead of drawing these switches and battery and light bulb, everything else, we depict the AND gate using using this kind of D letter shape. So you can see that we have two inputs. Basically, these two inputs, they are they represent these two switches, which we have here. And we obviously have the output, which is basically our light bulb in here. So you can see if those two switches are open, just like here, then we have this gate, which represents two zeros because the circuit is not uh, is not closed in this, in this part, okay? But once we close both 
of these switches, then we have basically two ones entering the gate, the end gate, and we get the, the one uh, on the output side. So you can see that in that case, this would be closed and then we would have the, the light being emitted. So if you do have a piece of wire, if you do have light bulb and a couple of switches, you can actually start implementing the end operator. So the conjunction operator in this uh, light switch world. When it comes to the disjunction operator, it's really straightforward, super similar. Instead of connecting them serially, we connect them in parallel, these two switches. Uh, the R gate is represented as this some kind of like always shape. You can see that if we like connected this uh, this line a little longer, there would be this letter O. So this is how we can uh, we can figure out which uh, what this gate is. And you can see everything else stays the same, right? We have two switches and we do have one output for the, for the diode. And you can see that if we close any of these two switches, then the circuit is effectively closed. So any of these two turns on the, the light switch. So this is how we build the the conjunction operator and the disjunction operator, okay? So the AND operator and the OR operator, okay? We need to build a couple more of them to have a full Boolean logic. So the next one we are going to build is called the inverter. So this may seem to be a pretty magical one because what we need to do is we need to have like no current entering the gate and then we need to have some current exiting the gate, right? So what would create this current where it comes from? So instead, there is no magic actually under the hood. What we need to have is we need to have two power sources or one power source connected like to two places. And we also need to have this electromagnet here. Imagine that this switch is basically tied to some spring, which makes it always return to the initial state like here. In that case, because there is no input on this side, so we can imagine there is big zero here, no current entering the gate, there is no electricity in this electromagnet and this switch is closed. So now this circuit here is closed. So you can see the light switch is emitting the light. So the diode is, is shining. So we can see there is one at the exit. So this is exactly this case. We have zero in this case because the, the switch is open and we have one in here because the light is uh, the light switch is emitting light. However, once we close this switch, what happens now is this electromagnet, the current starts flowing through it. And because this is a magnet, it starts pulling this switch over here. So it would pull the switch effectively clearing this circuit, opening the circuit, so the light switch would go off. So we would not have a light on this output side. So this is how you can see there is no magic here. We just connect the power source to, uh, via two different circuits. And this is how we can build the, the, inv the inverter. So this is what we use to build the tick, like the, the regular free operators. What we need to do now is we can build a couple more useful of them to, to make things simpler. So we can implement the not or operator and at the same time the not and operator. And you can see the pictures are exactly the same as for the previous operators, only at this time the uh, basically not or is the or gate with this circle at the very end indicating that this is the inverter. The XOR operator, so exclusive or is like or with this one additional line. And having all these things, we can start building uh, basically an arithmetic unit. So we would like to perform so phys some physical actual calculations, right? So the first thing we would like to build is basically the addition. So how do we add numbers using light switches? Obviously, right now we will start using more this gates notation, even though keep in mind that every, every time we are talking about the gates, we are actually using something like VIA's power source, a piece of wire, there is some ground in here, and there is obviously some light bulb here, which is emitting the light. So we are still in the same world, only we use different notation to make it a little simpler. So what we want to do now is we would like to build the so-called half adder. The half adder is supposed, what it's supposed to be doing is it will add two binary digits and ignore the possible carry, which may be there. So if we want to, if we have two input digits like A digit and B digit, what we need to do is we would like to calculate their sum depicted as S here. And you can see that the sum of them is basically the, the exclusive OR 
of these two things. The only tricky thing here is when we add two ones together, we should end with the number two being the result, which in binary is, is uh, written as one zero. And because we implement the half other only, the sum of this operation is on one bit only. The other bit is called carry, and we'll see in a minute how to handle it. So you can see that in order to implement this S bit here, what we implement, what we need to use is we need to basically use the XOR gate. The XOR gate, which you can see here, and the XOR, as you remember from C sharp language, it gives you one only when, uh, when exactly one of the inputs is set to one. Otherwise, it gives you zero when inputs are equal to each other. So this is how we come up with this S bit, which is here. And the other bit which we would like to calculate is the carry. Carry is basically a bit telling you that, hey, there was an overflow. Just like when you add two big integers in C-sharp language, which are close to something like 2 billion or 4 billion, depending whether it's signed or, signed or unsigned, you may have the overflow. So this is exactly what is happening in this situation. When we add two ones, we end with the result, which is obviously incorrect because it's zero. And we have this one bit telling us, hey, there was an overflow in here. So what we need to do if with this overflow, we'll need to include it in the summation when we move on to adding uh, other bits. And you can see that scary bit, this overflow, it happens only when both inputs were set to one. So we can just use the end gate to calculate the scary bit. Instead of drawing this, uh, this circuit over and over again, we can use notation like this. So basically rectangle named half other, which has two inputs, A and B, and which emits two outputs, basically the sum bit and the carry bit. So this is the half other. You can see it's called half other because it does only half of the work. So it calculates only the sum bit and some carry. How do we include this carry? Well, this is where we enter the world of the so-called full other. And in full other world, we not only have two binary digits, but we also have this one additional carry bit which is uh, from the previous bit calculation. So imagine now that we want to calculate like eight bit integer. What we do is we take the lowest bits of both of the of the inputs. So we'll get the first bit from the left of the input A and first bit of the input B. We'll calculate using half other, we'll calculate the sum and then we'll have the carry. Then we take the next bit, so second bit from the, from the left of the variable A, second bit from the left of the variable B. We want to sum them together. And we also would like to include this carry, which we get from the previous calculation. So this is how we start. And you can see that uh, the inputs are here the same way. We do have this half others here. And then we calculate carry in similar manner, telling that the carry happens only when it was like either in previous operation or current, or current operation. Um, so when we do this, you can see that we can actually stack these things together. So we start with like, no matter how big your integers are, if you want to have like eight integer, like integers which are eight bits long, what you need to basically do is, is you need to repeat this thing eight times. So you add bit by bit, get carry. You then add two to another bits with the carry. You get another bit, another carry, and so on and so on. And you repeat this eight times, 16 times, 32 times, depending what your integer is, how, how wide it is. So this is how we implement full other. And you can see that all of these things we can do just by using light switches. There is no magic in here because instead of using like the, the, the carry in or the A in, we imagine that there is some V as in voltage and piece of wire, which would be going here. And the sum out instead of like being zero or one, we could just depict the result as yet another light switch, okay? So this is how we can do it. And uh, using light switches and connecting pieces of wire together. So notice what we have already done. We know how to transfer signals somewhere, like from Europe to, to United States. Uh, we know how to implement Boolean logic, and we know how to perform a simple calculation, namely addition. When it comes to other operations like subtraction, like multiplication, etc., you probably imagine it's exactly the same idea, only the construction of these gates would be a little different, but it's based on the same principle. So what we need to do now is we would like to get a clock. 
a frequency of our CPU. So what we need to do is we need to come up with something which would measure the time. How do we measure the time? We can use a very counterintuitive thing, which is basically a closed circuit, which will close itself and open itself automatically. So what we do is we start with, uh, with an electro electromagnet, obviously some power source, and we have one switch over here and the other switch is over there. Okay, so initially what happens is there is no current flowing through the circuit. But once we close the circuit in this switch, what happens is, well, obviously the circuit is now closed. So the current is flowing through here and the electromagnet, well, has its, uh, the, the current is flowing through the electromagnet. Okay, so it pulls this switch over here. But once it pulls the switch over here, there is no electricity flowing through the circuit anymore because the circuit is open, okay? And because there is no electricity in here, there is no electricity in this electromagnet. So as we mentioned before, there is a spring in this switch, which would basically restore it to its original or the previous position. So when it gets restored to its previous position, we come back to this state. So there is again electricity flowing through here. So we can see that once we trigger this whole circuit, once we kicked off, it will keep turning on and turning off repeatedly, depending on how fast the, the, the electromagnet is or how strong the spring is. So you can see what we get here is basically a some way of measuring the time as some way of, uh, of uh, setting the frequency of our circuit. As long as there is a power in, the, in our computer, as long as our computer is turned on, we will have a constant periodic signal, which we can use for performing calculations or basically synchronizing things inside the, inside the, the, the whole computer, the whole circuit. Uh, when it comes to the notation, as you have seen on previous slide, it is somewhat counterintuitive and also the notation depicts that because we have a circuit which is basically like contradictory. Because if we have zero here, this gate is an inverter, so we get one here. So if we get one here and we go through this whole circuit, well, what happens is we get one here and then we get inverter again and we get zero here. So we close this again, we come back and we have zero again. So you can see this is like contradictory controlling itself. And we typically depict the time, uh, the time axis using this, uh, this shape of high voltage and low voltage here. So we can see high voltage is depicted as one, low voltage, the low voltage depicted as zero. So what we built now is basically a clock. We have some clock which we can use to control the computer. And now what we need to do to finish this up is we need to have a memory. So what we would like to have is we would like to have a circuit which is able to persist some data, persist some memory, even when we basically turn off the input signal. So we start in this place here on the very left. What we have here is we have a couple of gates here. So we have NOR gate, so not OR and not OR here. So initially you can see there is uh, electricity flowing only in this part, in this part here, okay? And we have two switches on the input side. And this is this whole circuit is called reset set flip-flop. So we do have a res, uh, we do have a set bit and we do have a reset bit. Okay. Once we close this set bit, you can see what is happening because this is a not or gate. When we put one in here, then what happens is we start putting zero in here, okay? Because it's not or, it negates the input of the, of the disjunction. So because it emits zero here, we have zero here and we have zero here, then we will have one flowing through here and this one will effectively return here. So now we basically go to, to this thingy here at the, uh, like in the middle at the top. So we can see this is what happens when we close this switch. You can see the light bulb is emitting some light. But notice what happens when we now open the circuit at this point, because we open it instead of having, uh, sorry, instead of having one here, what happens is we have zero at this point, okay? But because this part of the circuit wasn't changed at all, we still have one in here. 
And because we have one, the light switch is still on. We still have the light here. So you can see, even though we returned to the initial input, like we opened both the switches just like we started, you can see that now the difference that light switch is emitting some light, okay? So we effectively have a one bit of memory, which we can turn on by using this, this flip flop. What happens now is we can turn this memory off. We can like set it to zero just by putting or just by closing the circuit at this point. Because when we close the circuit at this point, we will be getting one here in this input. Then we will be having zero in this output. This zero will flow here. So effectively we end up in this place here at the bottom. So you can see that first light is turned off. There is no light, meaning that the bit was cleared. And also when we now open this switch in here, the only difference, the only thing which changes is we move from one here to zero here. So you can see that we end up in the initial situation. So just by using a couple of switches and just by using electricity and light bulb, this one light bulb now becomes a persistent bit of memory. As long as we do have the electricity flowing in our computer, we do have memory in our computer, which we can use to store some data effectively. So what we have now is we have Boolean logic, we have arithmetic, we have clock, we have memory. The only last thing we need to, to which we need to build a computer is basically a way of programming it. We need to have a way of decoding instructions, how to get some instruction from memory and understand what this instruction is supposed to be doing. So what we need to do is we need to build a very big if else condition, which would control the computer and which would make the, the whole things going on. So what we do is when we, I oh, will skip this for a sec. Uh, what we need to do is we need to build the so-called free to eight decoder, just for an example. So imagine that our input now is we do have a free bits representing instructions of our computer. So what we have is we may have, we have at most eight different instructions in our CPU because we have three bits to represent the instruction number, okay? And what we would like to build is this very complex if-else condition you can see here, which is basically setting one of these eight variables to true. And only one of these variables will be set to true. And when a variable is set, for instance, when O2 is set to true, it indicates that we would we now need to execute the instruction, which is basically like which has ID2 or whatever else, up to us what this instruction will do. So what we need to do in order to do that, we need to translate this if-else condition basically to a series of conjunctions and disjunctions. So you can see there are multiple gates in here, there are inverters in here and, and end gates in here. So we can figure out how these things work and how the circuit is flowing. However, the important part is we start with three bits like integer which is three bits long and we ate with eight different variables which we can use to determine which instruction we should be using now or which instruction which we should be executing so this is what we can do and that is basically it this is all we need to do to build the computer because we already have memory, calculations, Boolean logic, and now we have the hard, the workhorse of our CPU, which is basically a decoder figuring out which instruction to run. Now we make a big leap forward. So how to draw an all? You probably know this picture. Well, you start with the circus and then you draw the rest of the all, and this is the computer. Why is it the rest of the all? I told you at the beginning of this talk that it's not hard to build a computer. You can see that actually every all the pieces were already there. It's not something complex, complicated, sophisticated to build a computer. The thing which was hard is the scale of the computer. Because if we would like to have a memory which is like 64 kilobytes, then if we like if we go back to, to this reset set flip-flops here, we would need to have 64,000 of light switches in order to build that memory. Well, doable, probably not very easy to, to fit that in one room, right? So this is, the scale is exactly the thing which was killing us. The same thing goes, for instance, for, uh, for addition. 
like we started just by adding two bits, but now imagine that we have integers which are like 64 bits long. So we need to build a much bigger circuit to calculate them. Imagine that we do have um, uh, like 265 instructions, uh, like or even more instructions, which would be supported by our CPU. We would need to have a way bigger decoder, which would be able of, uh, to figure out what needs to be done. So this is actually the hard part with the with building the computer, not the concept. The concept is, is relatively simple, relatively straightforward. What is hard is how to make it small, how to make it fast, and how to make it heat effective, cost effective, and loudness effective, or whatever you call it. So it's not loud, it fits in the room, and it's fast. So that's the thingy. And having that, we can now move on to, to the actual real world, because let's now drop all the light switches. We understand how the light switches work, and let's now see how these things could be, uh, or how these things are implemented in real life. So the big thing which was invented last, uh, like, uh, like last century is the semiconductor and the transistor. So conductors are very good, very conducive to the passage of electricity. So what we have here on the physical level is we basically have atoms and there is a lone electron which we can kick so it starts flowing to, to the neighboring atom, yes? So if we have plenty of these lone electrons, then this is basically what makes the, the current. Uh, insulators, on the other hand, like rubber, like plastic, like other things, they do not allow for this lone electron to move across the wire. On the other hand, semiconductors which were invented they are not called semi because well they conduct half as well as conductors but because we can manipulate how good they are we can uh, we can add some uh, impurity we can dope them so we can control their physical abilities Actually, pure semiconductors aren't good conductors at all. What is important for us is we can control them, we can tune them to our needs. And this is how NTN transistors started. Uh, this is actually a very, very hard part for physics to explain how the transistors work. What is important for us is that we do have two inputs on the on this transistor, base and collector, and we have one output, the emitter. The important part here is if we put small voltage here, then effectively the big current starts flowing over here. So this is how the transistor works. And it was invented by, uh, by people who then won the Nobel Prize, Shockley, Bardeen, and the Breton. And this is one of the, the biggest invention of the last century. So how do we use these transistors to build all the things which we build with light switches? Well, it's exactly the same principle. Just like for the conjunction operator, we were connecting two switches together linearly, the same way we can connect two transistors linearly. So if we put some input over here, there will be like a current flowing over here, right? If we put another, uh, if we, sorry, if we put uh, electricity over here, there will be a current going on here. So we can see that just by connecting them linearly, we can build the conjunction operator. The same thing, the same idea is for for the disjunction operator. We just connect these two transistors in parallel. And then if no matter whether the electricity was here or was here, the output will be, will be set to one. So there will be some current flowing to the output. You can now imagine that the same things which we build with like the inverters, so the negation gate, the NAND gate, NOR gate, the memory, the clock, everything else stays the same. The only difference is instead of using like switches and light switches, we now use transistors. And uh, uh, why is it better to use transistors? The, B, the thing about transistors is they are small, so we can put multiple of them in much smaller space than we could do with like light switches or vacuum tubes or whatever else. And the, because of that, uh, we can also build the so-called some prefabricated components, which we call chips. And uh, so you can just buy something like full other chip out of the box and start using it. So we now enter the world of the so-called components of the shelf. So you enter the store and you buy things you need to use in your computer and you don't need to connect all these transistors one by one.
On the other hand, the problem or the issue with transistors is that, well, they do emit plenty of heat, a lot of heat. So uh, the construction of computers or the CPUs nowadays is facing this challenge that we would like to uh, make these transistors and make these connections between them smaller and smaller and smaller. But if we put them closer together, they start emitting much more heat. So the whole circuit may just overheat and just break. So this is the challenge, one of the biggest challenges. And this is something which physics needs to solve. This is not something on a like a logical computer science site and uh, this is a physics which we which we sometimes cannot overcome but that's the idea you can now take all the light switches which we covered in the first part of this talk replace them with transistors everything else stays the same and you have your computer up and running uh, so let's now do something else because we started with the light switches now we would like to get to the high level language like c sharp so let's see how the computer is constructed so this is what we'll focus on during the rest of this talk uh, so we start with this integrated circuits there are multiple physical technologies like transistor transistor logic ttl or cmos uh, the important thing here is we can like connect more of them together to build more and more sophisticated blocks so we don't necessarily need to connect all of them one by one but we just go to the store buy something this is the idea and there were terms like micro scale mini scale ultra big scale etc etc they referred to the number of transistors which were put on like one square feet or something like this like basically on the area unit and now we don't use this anymore because well we have billions of transistors connected together so there are not necessarily that many synonyms to represent how big the scale is now. So we start with this and we would like to get to the computer architecture. So we would like to build a computer, not necessarily the, the building blocks of the computer, but we would like to connect them together so they work effi efficiently, effectively together. So what we have in our computer is basically the CPU, the random access memory. We do have some way of getting instructions into the memory. So we do have some input device providing the instructions. We need to have some way of showing the result. So the output device, for instance, this could be a bulb, a light switch. We would also like to have some memory and all these things, they need to be connected together. Uh, now, the question is, how do we do that? And in order to connect these things, we need to build a thing which is called bus. Uh, so a bus is basically, you can think of it as of a, like a long wire to which all the things are connected together. I mean, memory, I mean, CPU, I mean, other things. And basically this bus, this big wire or actually a collection of wires is capable of flowing the data from like one piece to another. So what a bus is, it has multiple wires on the inside. Some of them are wires for the address, setting the address. Some of them are for data input. Some of them are for data output, but it's basically a, like plenty of wires put together. So this is how bus works. And obviously now we enter uh, something which we know a little more because it's almost a computer science because there are multiple standards, just like with everything in computer science or with IT world, there must be some concept which has so many different implementations which are obviously incompatible. And the same happens on the hardware level. When you have bus, there are multiple different buses. There is like MCA, I2C, etc. etc. There are different standards over there. And they were developed over time. They evolved. Some of them were dropped. Some of them were uh, like enjoyed more. People use them more. So this is how these things start. Just the same way we have now here now in our world, like nowadays, we do have multiple competing high-level languages, right? C-sharp, Java, JavaScript, whatever else. Back then, though, it was exactly the same, only what was competing was not the languages, but the, for instance, bus architectures. Once we have this bus, what we need to do next is we need to figure out how to put things together. And this is when we enter the so-called computer architecture type. One of them is called von Neumann architecture. So von Neumann architecture is basically a way of setting the computer in a way that both data and instructions are stored in the same data storage and they are addressed by the same memory address. Meaning that you actually, when you read something, you don't know whether it's code 
or whether it's a, a memory, like some data. This is what you have on your x86 architecture currently. When you read some memory, you don't know whether this is actually like some variable, like integer, double, or, or a string. Or is it a, a series of instructions which needs to be executed? And this is like how you can execute your data, which could be a, a security risk. So this is the von Neumann architecture, which is now prevalent nowadays. Um, actually, it's a little more complicated because there are other architectures which put some other constraints or some other ways of, of doing the same. For instance, the Harvard architecture uh, is, uh, is based on this principle that we have separate address space for memory and separate address space for instructions. This can be faster because your computer can now read two things at the same time, can read the instruction and the memory to operate on. Uh, on the other hand, this is all slightly less flexible. So that's why we do have the modified Harvard architecture, which we, for instance, use in CPU caches, et cetera, et cetera. The important thing, the takeaway of these slides is when someone asks you, hey, how is your computer constructed? You typically should answer that it's von Neumann architecture because data and instructions are in the same memory address. And then we enter, we already know that we do have this bus connecting things together. We do know that we would like to build a computer which puts everything in one memory according to von Neumann architecture and this then does something fancy with it. So now we need to come up with a way of defining or, or providing a, a standard for our CPU so that others can actually program it, can provide some applications for this, for this CPU. And this is where we enter the so-called CPU architecture. And this term is very ambiguous. It uh, may mean multiple things depending on the context we, we talk about. But typically when we say computer architecture or CPU, sorry, CPU architecture, what we mean is the instruction set architecture, the ISA. This is basically a way of specifying how we encode the instructions. Remember, uh, my Twitch just died. I hope you can hear me. Uh, and I don't know if it's something on my side or something else. Are we here? You just fine. Cool. So I'll just carry on. Uh, so when it comes to to the um, uh, the ISA instruction set architecture, just like when we had this slide with three to eight decoder, I told you that we have three bits. So like we have eight instructions, and this is exactly the piece we are talking about. How many instructions we have? how long these instructions are, whether they are encoded or one integer, multiple integers, how they accept parameters, because each CPU instruction must know how to get the parameters, which registers to use, which memory addresses, etc. So this is what we define in the ISA in the CPU architecture. And when it comes to ISA architecture, we typically define them or classify them depending on the complexity we would like to have on our instruction set. And the complexity is tied to what data types we support, whether we can, for instance, add two integers which are 32 bits long or maybe only 16 bits long, or maybe we allow for integers up to 64 bits long or whatever else. When it comes to the memory consistency, which operations can be reordered and why and how, all these things are actually defined by the instruction set architecture. And there are multiple different types, multiple different classifications. The, the acronyms you may be aware of is, for instance, a CISC, which is Complex Instruction Set Computer, which is basically what we have in our x86 CPUs currently. So complex here means that one instruction, or technically there is instructions may be of a different length. If you ever written some assembly code, you probably know that some instructions like knob instruction, they are like one byte long only. But some other instructions, for instance, jump instruction, it takes not only, it takes one byte for defining, hey, this is a jump instruction, and then four additional bytes for specifying the offset where to jump to. Uh, so this is what CISC basically is, that there are instructions of completely different length. On the other hand, 
there is a reduced instruction set computer, which is abbreviated RISC. And this is um, a, a way of defining the instructions so they are always as reduced as possible, meaning they are, for instance, of the same length. There is, uh, we have quite a few of them. We don't have very complex instructions, for instance, for encoding or compressing video. Uh, so we need to put, uh, in order to write something in assembly, we need to write many, many, many more instructions. On the other hand, because they are simpler and they are shorter, your CPU can execute them faster. And this is what is actually happening on x86 architecture nowadays. You write assembly using the CISC instruction set, so you have an access to multiple complex instructions. On the other hand, then CPU translates them using the microcode to the reduced instruction set. So, the, so these instructions are simple and uh, we can execute them faster. Obviously, there are other architectures, just like with everything in IT world, there are multiple standards and not necessarily compatible with each other, but these two, CISC and RISC, are most prevalent. And now we get to some history part. Uh, so let's see a couple dates. Uh, the IBM, uh, or actually the Intel, produced the 8080 processor, which was 8-bit at the time, and which was actually a big step forward. Why? That is because Intel wanted to maintain the compatibility. Just like right now, you do have, for instance, new version of, of operating system or take new version of your programming language, which is not compatible with the previous one. The same thing we actually had in the hardware uh, in the hardware world back then, because the CPUs were completely incompatible with each other. So imagine that you are writing your tool and you cannot port it not only to different operating systems, you cannot port it even to different CPU because the other CPU uses different instruction set and it's completely incompatible and completely not portable for you. So Intel wanted to solve that and it started with the 8080 CPU and wanted to maintain the compatibility. So then happened the 8085 micro microprocessor, which was compatible with 8080. Then we had this 8086, which was 16-bit microprocessor. So it could address way more of a memory, like up to one megabyte of memory, but it wasn't compatible with 8080. But then in, a, in a 1979, the 8088 microprocessor was introduced, which was not only identical to 8086 in terms of the, the how wide the integers were, so it was 16-bit architecture, but it was also compatible with 8080. So this allowed for migration or for reusing the code which was written for 8080 with the, with the new CPU. And 8088 was used in, in the 5150 personal computer, which we typically call the IBM PC. So this is a, a part, a bit of history. And we can see that uh, all these things uh, like we wanted or actually Intel wanted to solve this problem that all the CPUs were incompatible. And in order to do that, what we had to do is we basically had to uh, maintain some compatibility, some backwards compatibility. The thing with backwards compatibility is that, uh, well, what happens is you need to have this burden of the legacy stuff, of the old software which was there. And this legacy stuff may not necessarily be simple to, to, to support. So if you don't know what to do, uh, if you don't know what to do, you get a very big bag of what you need to use, what you need to support, so it gets more and more complex. So this is what actually has happened with x86 architecture, which we how we call it nowadays. We started with something which was 16-bit architecture, and then we had an extension to it called x86-32, or the Intel architecture 32, which was 32-bit extension. So we wanted to have bigger integers, more instructions. We wanted to support more, more, more. Uh, and there was the 8386 uh, 80, CPU, which was 32-bit uh, architecture, but it was compatible 
with the old CPU. However, it's not a straightforward compatibility. The CPU now introduced the so-called different mode. So we may have like the real mode, we may have protected mode. Later on, 64-bit CPUs introduced the so-called long mode. So we have different like different CPUs inside one of the, if inside the CPU unit. Uh, so you can execute these applications and maintain the compatibility. But on the other hand, the complexity increases significantly. Uh, interesting part, if you ever wondered how the 64th bit architecture started, well, initially Intel wanted to get rid of the 8086 architecture completely. It wanted to replace it with the so-called IA64 architecture, so Intel Architecture 64, which was completely different based on completely different principles. It was capable of running the old applications like 32-bit applications, but they were terribly slow. So Intel failed with this. On the other hand, AMD uh, developed the extension to x86 32-bit, uh, which was 64-bit long, and they called it AMD 64. It was later adapted by, uh, by Intel, so now it's called Intel 64. So just keep in mind that Intel Architecture 64 and Intel 64 are two completely different things. Intel Architecture 64 is dead, no one uses that. Intel 64 is basically what we have now as a 64-bit architecture. Uh, so this is how these things evolved. And because of because we maintained the compatibility, we stopped worrying that, hey, application which we have written for that CPU will not work for new CPU. Right now, you don't even think that that could be a problem. You don't care whether you have Intel CPU, AMD CPU. It just works because it's the same architecture. You more care whether it's the same operating system and the portability may be a problem over there. But you don't are not scared that, that the CPU may, be, uh, may break your applications. Uh, the important part also, by adding more and more, uh, like extending the architectures, Intel and other uh, vendors also introduced more and more instructions. So I told you that this is CISC, so complex instruction set. So we do have multiple different instructions. We have instructions for addition, instructions for jumping, but later on extensions like SSE or AVX were introduced. So these are basically a, a set of instructions tuned to do something specific, for instance, work on the vectors of integers. So currently what you can do is you can, for instance, add 512 bits at once, meaning that you can add eight long integers just by using one single CPU instruction. You can actually encrypt your data using AES by using two instructions on the CPU level. It's not something you need to write in C Sharp, it just compiles down to two instructions. The advantage of that, well, it's crazy fast, Disadvantage of that, well, it increases complexity like crazy. So this is why ARM architecture is getting more and more popular or actually is prevalent, for instance, mobile devices, because ARM does not support all these instructions. It's much simpler, so it can be a little more like energy effective, so it doesn't consume your battery like crazy. So this is like, a, you know, a trade-off you need to make, whether you want to have a powerful CPU, which may consume a lot of energy, or or you may have much more basic unit, which on the other hand can be used in like low level devices or low energy devices. So we do have these additional instructions. And this is a moment when we enter the actual code writing. We already have the CPU. We know how to build it, uh, starting with light switches going for transistors. We know how to construct the computer using von Neumann architecture. We know how to connect pieces together using, the, using bus. Now what we need to do is we need to start programming. So the first thing, which is at the very lowest level, which we in theory can touch, is called a microcode. Microcode is below the machine code. If you ever seen the assembly language, assembly language is one level above the machine code. Why is that? Because in assembly language, when you do instruction like add, it's one mnemonic, one name for the instruction, and it's compiled to different machine code depending on what arguments you provide to add. If you add, for instance, registers like EAX and EBX, it's different machine code than when you are adding EBX with ECX. 
However, below this assembly and below this machine code, there is a microcode, something which is put or which is stored directly in the CPU, something which calculates, for instance, branch predictions or memory reordering or other things, something which is written by the, uh, like the, by the Intel designers and something we can most of the time we never touch it. We can update it though uh, using like, for instance, Windows updates. Windows can update your CPU, the microcode in your CPU. Think about, for instance, hard bleed or spectrum meltdown, uh, uh, like security vulnerabilities, right? These things were patched by Windows updates. So Windows provided an update, which basically went there and modified how your CPU was working on a very, very, very low level. Level. Uh, when it comes to microcode, it's super not portable. It's tied to the physical CPU it's running on, so you cannot just move it between CPUs. On the other hand, we are not touching it. It runs directly in the CPU. It's not accessible to, to us regular developers, regular programmers. On top of that, there is the machine code. If you ever decompile your like native application and if you ever decompile it to the hexadecimal output, so you have seen the bits and bytes, this is actually the machine code you are executing. So just like I told you that one add instruction may compile to different machine instructions, this is the machine instructions I'm talking here. It's generally hard to read, hard to write. We almost never write it directly like by hand. What we do is we write an assembly and then compile assembly down to the machine code. Uh, the machine code is executed by the CPU directly. It can be provided by the regular programmer. You can actually even generate machine code uh, directly from your C-sharp applications if you are interested or really high level languages. It's still possible and you can do it. On top of the machine code, there is an assembly language, which is a readable form of machine code and where one instruction can be compiled down to multiple different physical machine instructions. It's typically assembled by the assembler, then linked into the executable. And this is what we typically use when we talk low level. If you want to go really low level, this is what we typically use. We very rarely de de develop machine, uh, machine code like directly by hand, we typically just use the assembly language. Uh, it's somewhat portable. It's portable between CPUs, that's for sure. It may not necessarily be portable between the, the operating systems. That depends on the security mechanism which your operating system implements. And when talking about operating systems, just like with everything in computer world, we have multiple standards which are obviously incompatible. So each operating system gives you a set of instructions which we call an API application programming interface. So we may get WinAPI, the API in the Windows operating system, we may get system V, we may get POSIX. So these are different standards of what instructions, what APIs are provided to us. And these functions are implemented in the operating system. They are typically implemented in some, uh, let's say, high level language like C++, like C, sometimes using Rust nowadays, uh, it very rarely uses the the assembly language only for the parts that are interacting with the hardware directly. And we can use these APIs like directly in our applications, either in kernel mode when we are developing drivers, on in user mode when we are just writing native applications, like for instance, Notepad Exe. Uh, when it comes to the kernel and user mode, a quick note on this. The kernel and user mode, these are two different ways of controlling the security because we do not want to break our hardware. So we should not be allowed to execute all the instructions when we are just running like the application like Zoom or the application, you know, just a regular app. We should not be able to touch all the internals of operating system or the internals of hardware things to not break our printer or something. So that's why CPUs, they introduce so-called rings, rings of permissions. The kernel mode is in ring zero. The user mode is in ring three. So the higher the number, is the less permissions we have or the, the fewer instructions we can actually access. Uh, rings one and two were used back then, like 30 years ago, depending on the architecture. By, they were not used in all the architectures. Uh, however, they are still in theory supported and sometimes they are used, for instance, for virtual machines, like your virtual machine may be running in ring one in order to improve the performance. Uh, 
yeah, that's it when it comes to security, obviously some other nifty details, but we'll just skip them. And now we enter the user mode. What we were doing up to now, we were implementing something which was, let's say, low level. But now let's say that we are implementing a regular user mode application, which is not able to touch the hardware directly, which is very limited, very constrained by the operating system. And when we are talking native applications here, we are typically talking like about C, C++, these languages, which are then down compiled down to some machine code, sometimes compiled down to assembly, which is in turn compiled to, uh, to the machine code. Sometimes this assembly can be some portable assembly, like LLVM is some way of making this assembly portable so the optimizations can be introduced no matter which language you use. But generally we just compile, we think of them, of these native applications are compiled down to the, to the machine code. Uh, they cannot access peripherals, they need to talk to the operating system, they cannot do anything on their own. They basically need to rely on the instruction set, which in this case is the Windows API or System V or POSIX. Uh, and on top of that, we start building yet another CPU-like thingy, which is basically yet another platform to increase the portability. Because obviously, native application is not portable between operating systems. It's portable between CPUs, but not between operating systems. However, what we would like to do is we would like to introduce yet another layer of indirection, which is like a JVM, CLR, V8, web browser, whatever else platform, which we don't care where we are actually executing, whether it's Linux, Windows, Mac OS, Solaris, whatever else, because what we use is we just use the API provided by this platform. So this is how we, this is when we enter the CLR world, it's a native application written on top of the WinAPI or native application written on top of System V or POSIX. However, it exposes the same interface in both cases. So when we write something in C Sharp, we just use the CLR API. So we don't care what the operating system is there under the hood. There are multiple managed languages which we can use when talking C Sharp, uh, or sorry, when talking .NET World, we typically use the intermediate language. This is like an assembly language for CLR. And you probably know that C Sharp language is compiled down to the assembly, the intermediate language. However, we can write the intermediate language directly. Sometimes we do it to improve the performance, but typically we just use the high level language, which is basically C Sharp, Java, JavaScript, Python, all these things which are interpreted, compiled sometimes to bytecode to, to, and then executed by the platform, they all fall into the same bucket. They are typically portable, meaning that uh, if we don't do anything logically, which was not logically not portable, for instance, when we do not mess up with the, I don't know, directory separators or new lines, then all these things, they should be uh, portable pretty easily uh, across different technologies, different operating systems. And this is where our journey effectively ends. So how does it work? When we go back, when we write application in high level managed language like C Sharp, it is compiled down to the intermediate language running on top of the CLR. So intermediate language cannot access anything which is below the CLR. It can only access the CLR API. Then CLR compiles this code, this intermediate language code, down to some machine code, which is running in user space. This machine code can access the operating system API, which is exposed to the user space. And this operating system API, think Win API here, is basically using some native code, which is running in kernel space. And that native code was written most likely in C++, because Windows is written mostly in C++. Sometimes it was written in the assembly language when it was touching the hardware, but no matter which language we use, it was compiled down to the native code again running in the kernel mode this time. Then this native code or this machine code is actually not necessarily compiled, but is translated by the microcode to the reduced instruction set. And then this in reduced instruction set is executed finally by the transistors or if we built our computer with light switches, it would be executed using the bulbs where we started. So this is how it works. This is how we end our journey here. And as you can see, 
Computers are, well, relatively simple, straightforward concept. There is nothing hard in it. The big obstacle and the big challenge here is how to make them small, how to make them heat effective, and how to make them running fast. That's the only thing. When it comes to the history, it took us many years to come up to, to get to the place where we had standards, where we had some portability. And we could, had to solve this on every single layer of our application or of our computer. We had to come up with standards for exchanging data between components. We had to come up with standards of the CPU instructions. We had to come up with standards of the operating systems. Now we come up with standards like .NET standards who knows what standards we'll have like 10 years from now, but it's all exactly the same, only we add yet another level of the indirection to make this a little more portable. And if you ever think that machine code is the lowest level you can see, now you probably understand that it's not the case. Sometimes it's not even close to the actual code which is executing over there. And having all of that said, it's time for a questions. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Cool. Uh, I don't see any questions. Let me see the chat. No, I don't see anything over there. Uh, by the way, I do enjoy your conversation. What was the first computer you were using? That was really nice, a piece of history. Uh, OK, so let's just wrap this thing up. Uh, some references. Typically, if you ever watched my other talk, I do put plenty of references. However, for this talk, there is basically one book. It's called Code, The Hidden Language of Computer Hardware and Software by Charles Petzold. This is actually a really great book. A uh, lot of images I used in this talk are actually coming from this book, but over there you can read way more details about architecture, about all these things, about how this all started, how it translated, etc., etc. So this is a really, really nice book to read if you are interested in this, in this area. And being all of that said, I'd like to thank you for attending this talk. My name is Adam Furmanek. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you liked it. And thank you for having me here. It was a pleasure.